guys know how blessed we are to have this as a worship team in this church. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, man. Oh, boy. Kim, you noticed one of the slides jumped. That was my fault. I pushed my clicker. Okay, I did it on purpose. I wasn't sure if it would work. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> it worked, just so you know. So I, I really just had this strong, this overwhelming, this gripping sense that, that the Lord wanted me to preach on hope. Now, I don't know your story. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you've done. Hope is just one of those things that we hear hope and we think, oh, that's nice. It sounds nice. It's one of those buzzwords. It's one, oh, yeah, hope, hope, hope. I, I, I hope that the weather's nice today. I hope that it doesn't rain. I, I hope I get a raise at work. Gee, I hope this person maybe feels about me the way I feel about them. I, I, I hope, I hope, I hope. But that's not the hope that God wants for us. Amen? You see, God is interested in things that last. He's interested in relationships that last. He's interested in, in, a, in a spiritual currency, like I mentioned earlier, that can never run out. I have other currency that can run out, right? Runs out a lot, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Last week we talked about this is hope, and we, and we looked at at who Jesus is, right? In him, there's no higher authority than we can find in Jesus. He is the apex. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. All these things we hear, but we explored a little bit more. We, we looked at the fact that all the fullness of God rests in Jesus and that he himself is available to us. And then ultimately, that he reconciles all things to God in himself. We looked at who Jesus is, and that gives us hope today what we will look at is what Jesus has done. What he has done and what that means to us. You ever have somebody come to you and say, hey, I took care of this thing, right? Or I, finished, I took out the trash, I cleaned up the house, I went and put gas in the car, and maybe our response is, oh, cool, thanks. Or how about this, when, when someone makes a delivery to your door, and they say, here you go, here's your, here's your pizza, here's your package. Great, thanks. <clears throat> you all know where I'm going with this, right? Now, Jesus isn't looking for a tip, but there is something that he does expect from us. We are continuing in Colossians chapter 1, and as we do, I would like to open with a word of prayer. Jesus, thank you for all that you do for us. Would you please meet us in this place this morning, God? Right here in the heart of summer, Lord, when you know church attendance is up and down and people are on vacation or maybe they're on the boat, they're, they're out doing fun stuff, they're shopping, they're doing anything but thinking about you sometimes, Lord. But God, we're grateful and privileged to be in your house exploring your word. Would you give us eyes to see what sometimes maybe we've missed, Lord? Ears to hear truth that maybe has been told to us a million times and, and, and maybe today we get something different. And most importantly, God, hearts that are willing and open to receive all that you have for us, that you give us courage to move forward in what you teach us, Jesus. We ask this in your precious, precious name. God's people said together, amen. I love the word amen. It means let it be so, right? Let it be so. Jesus, meet us in this place. Colossians chapter 1. Now, I'm going to start at verse 21, which directly follows. Remember, last week we looked at verses 15 through 20, talking about the person of Christ. Now, let's take a look, starting in verse 21, at what he has done for us. Verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Now, but now, listen, now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You'll notice 
Once you were alienated from God, now he has reconciled you if you continue in your faith. Once, now, if. Past, present, future. Before, here and now, and what's to come. God isn't just interested in where you've been. He's not just interested in where you are. He is ultimately concerned with where you are going. Can you guys bring me down just a little bit on the board, please? I'm about to get excited. Who knows what will happen? I know what will happen. I'll sweat. That's what will happen. Once, now, if, why is that important? Because Jesus is concerned with all of it. Sometimes we think, you know, all the little problems I have in my life, God's not concerned with that. God's not thinking about this. He's not thinking about that. He doesn't care about what kind of day I had or how much money I'm short. He doesn't care about the car problem. He cares about it all, folks. Because we're his children. Because he made provision for once. He makes provision for now. He's making provision for later. Once, now, if. It's all under his purview. Amen? It's all in the area of concern he cares very much about. But here's the thing. If he cares about once, if he cares about now, if he cares about if, does that mean then that we might need to examine the full scope of our life and choices? Because he makes it very clear once... You were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. He knows that there was a separation between him and us. He says, now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. We talked about that last week. What Jesus has done, reconciling, making things right between God and us. But this is the key. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. There's a lot of if statements in the Bible that sometimes we tend to gloss over, right? But this message, the once, the now, the if, brings us a lot of hope. And I want to talk about what that looks like. Because if it brings hope, if he has made provision for us, the question we have to ask then is, so what? What does that mean to me? Well, I'm glad you asked. First and foremost, our actions, is that hard to read? Okay. It's so frustrating when you sit in your computer and you think, this looks amazing, I can't wait to put it up, and you throw it up on the screen and people go, what is that, what is that from the Bible? I'm actually thinking, and and tech team is the first time you're hearing of it, I think I'm just going to switch to a black background with white letters, I think it's just easier to read, yeah, okay, Hunter likes that, okay. Hey, if Hunter's happy, I'm happy, let me just say that, okay. Verse 21 tells us, our actions reveal our hearts, Okay. Our actions, the way we act, the way we talk, the way we respond is going to show us exactly what's going on inside. Amen? I will tell you right now, Saturday, September, uh, what's the day, the first maybe, Notre Dame kicks off their season. It's opening day. You can call, you can have an emergency, whatever happens, I don't care, I'm not answering my phone, all right? This is opening day for Notre Dame football. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, baby. I don't know about y'all, I can't wait for football season, right? Imagine if we were as excited about what God has done inside of us. Listen to this, Romans 8, verses 5 through 8. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds, listen, set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds, again, set on what the Spirit desires. Verse 6, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is what? Life and peace, right? That's a, that's a great word right now, life and peace. Verse 7, the mind, is governed, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Verse 8, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. This is a tough one to preach because folks have a hard time. I'm just going to tell you right now. We do not live in an age of accountability and responsibility right now, okay? We do not live in an age where people like to say, yeah, that's my fault. Hey, that mistake was mine. That screw up is on me. What are the number one words you hear come out of somebody's mouth when something goes wrong? Not my fault. Wasn't me, not my, not my fault. Oh, I just want to throw a rock at something when I hear that. Preferably the person saying it. No, okay, I shouldn't say that, sorry. Nervous laughter, don't worry, I'm not talking about anybody in here. 
No, but really, we, we, we live in a culture that does not value accountability. And the number one thing I see in our walk with God that I think needs to be addressed is that we must be accountable for our actions. We must take responsibility for the decisions that we make. And, and it's really easy to say, that's not my fault. I had nothing to do with that. That's, here's the thing, folks. It may not be your fault, but eventually it will become your problem. The question is, what do you do with that problem? Do we pass it off on somebody else and say, well, you know what? I didn't cause that mess. I'm not cleaning it up. Or do we become folks who say, I'm not responsible. I, I didn't make the decisions that ended us up here, but I will roll up my sleeves and get to work and get us out of this mess. Or at the very least, do my part to help. I am not good at passing the buck off on other people. And if people make a mistake, I fully expect them to say, that's on me. If you lie, if you make excuses, if you, it, I have no use for that. Because it's not what God wants. The, the scripture tells us, it says those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. When we set our minds to something, it means this is where I'm fixed and I'm not going to allow anything else to get in the way. Amen? Put me, put me in front of an all-you-can-eat chicken wing buffet. You're not getting in my way, folks. It's not going to happen. I love chicken wings. Anybody here love chicken wings? All right, all right, six or seven of us. I'll see you all after church. When your mind is set on something, you can't be deviated from it. You can't deviate from it because that's what you want. But it says that the mind, <clears throat> those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Does God want more for me than chicken wings? Apparently. Does God have better things in mind for us? Oh, you're not sure. Well, let's go back to Scripture. Let's go to verse 6. The mind governed by the flesh is death. How many of you guys think that God intended death for you? No, right? But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Jesus made it very clear. Matthew 11, 18 through 20. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He knows that we struggle. He knows that we've got stress. He knows that life is hard. You ever wake up some days and you're like, I'm just done with this. Life is too hard. Guess what? He knows and he cares once, now, if. Amen? Our hearts, what we do is revealed in our actions. What we're feeling, what we're thinking, what's going on inside. Let me just tell you right now. If, you, if you're not sure what's going on inside your heart, stub your toe. Smash your finger with a hammer in the garage. Oh, man. Anybody? Okay, I'm the only one. Let me just tell you. When I stub my toe at 3 o'clock in the morning on the bouncer, Pastor Jerob is not in the same room, okay? Nothing Jesus-y about what can come out sometimes. That's why we need the Spirit to fill us. Amen. We need to fix our minds. And he's the key word. This is not a popular word in today's culture. And it is submission. To set your mind. Listen to this. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, right? Not in a friendly place with God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Let me tell you about the word submission. Real submission doesn't even occur until a disagreement happens. Otherwise, we're just all in agreement, pointing in the same direction. If you've been married longer than five minutes, five minutes, you know that this equation is true. You do have the right, I suppose, to say, husbands, I'm the head of this household. And your wife will say, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, okay, let's see. How, yeah, all right. Wise is the man that says, so, baby, what are you thinking? If the man is the head, the woman is the neck. You try and do something with a kink in your neck. 
We must submit to the law of God by fixing our minds on that which God desires for us. Amen? It's not submission if you agree. It's submission when you don't. There are times that what your flesh wants is not what God wants. I would say those times are more often than not. Whatever your gut reaction is, go the other way. Someone cut you off in traffic, quote a Bible verse instead of whatever else was coming out, right? Ever been burned, stabbed in the back, done wrong, cheated, mistreated? The mind governed by the flesh is death. The mind governed by the spirit, the mind in submission to the law of God can please him. Second thing is this. If our hearts, I'm sorry, our actions reveal our hearts. Here's the thing about our hearts. Our hearts are meant for holiness, okay? For holiness. This is what verse 22 says. I like this in Ephesians 1, and I'm going to read verses 4 through 8 in the book of Ephesians. Listen. For he, right, God, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. That capital O, who is that one? Jesus, right? Verse 7, in him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the richness of God's grace that he has lavished on us. Now, if I were to take a poll of opinion, and I don't want, I just want you to think about this. You don't have to raise your hand. But how many of you just in thinking feel like you are worthy and deserving of someone to lavish love and blessing upon you? Just think about that for a second. Because I think the answer is probably better suited in this response, right? How many of you, don't raise your hand, but just think about it. How many of you more aptly feel unworthy, right? You ever feel unworthy of that love, unworthy of those blessings? But it's what it says is, he chose us, right? He chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So here's how this works. God says, I want you to be holy and blameless in my sight, but I can't rely on you to make that happen. I need to make a way to do so. Moms manage a lot in the household, do they not? Do moms manage a lot? When you empower your kids to do a task, how often do you expect for it to be done right the first time? Ever? (laughs) Carrie, that's a pretty big sigh. (laughs) Moms, you tell your kids, I want you to go clean your room, and I want you to do it what? The way I like it, right? What does that usually mean? You're going to have to go in there with them and do what? Clean it yourself. Hey, Mom, let me help you with that. Sure, you sit on the bed and help me. Thank you. God expects us to be holy and blameless, but what does he have to provide in order for that to happen? The the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, that does what? Redeems us to God, right? Once we were alienated from God, now we have been reconciled through the blood of Christ. And if we can stay in that vein, if we continue, right? But listen to this. And and, and this, I think, we misunderstand what that word holy means. Holy does not mean perfect, okay? Not in the sense that we think it does. Holy actually, and this is in the original language, What he's saying is this, it means two specific things, to be unlike or set apart, right? We've heard that before. Holy means to be be set apart, like, right, for the purposes of God, to be unlike everything else that you see, right? I look at that table of sweets out there, Brittany, and those peanut butter cookies are unlike anything else on the table. Jason, your kettle corn is unlike any other popcorn I'm going to have, okay? Let me just tell you, that kettle corn, if you haven't had his kettle corn, it is a touch of heaven, sweet Jesus, thank you. Unlike, set apart, distinctively different, and yet it also means this. A saint or someone who is devoted to God. Devoted. Not interested in, not buddy-buddy, not hangout, not... Guilt blanket, I don't know what a guilt blanket is, right? 
feeling guilty about something, you drape it over your shoulders. Oh, no, I feel better. Jesus is not your personal vending machine. But what he does provide, right, when he says holy and blameless in his sight, he provides you through his blood the, diff- the, the, the ability to be unlike and set apart for the purposes of God and also a saint whose heart can be fully devoted and fixed on him. And I'll tell you right now, if that is not the goal of your Christian walk, you're doing it wrong, okay? I just want to make that plain as day. The Bible said the goal of what he chose us to be, he set us apart to be holy and blameless before him. We are the bride of Christ, amen? And no bride on their wedding day wants to show up in a chopped up looking dress. Disheveled, a mess. If that was your wedding day, I apologize. But we don't prepare ourselves, especially in light of a wedding day, we don't prepare ourselves to go out there and give it mediocrity. When you exchange the vows with your spouse, it's not till death do us part unless something else comes up, right? How many of you looked at your spouse on your wedding day and said, I promise to to love you and to be faithful to you unless something better comes along? That doesn't work, does it? Some people do it, and I'm sorry if that's been your experience, but it's not what God intends for us, amen? It's not at all what he intends for us, to be unlike, to be set apart, to be devoted to him in light of all that he's done for us. If our hearts are meant for holiness, here's the key to holiness. Our holiness must be intentional. It must be intentional. This is a tricky one to preach on in church because folks like to say things like, well, you know, I'm waiting on the blessing of God to come into my life. No, 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 no. I don't have to do any extra work. He's already promised it to me. Blessing is going to rain down from heaven. God knows I've got a financial need, so I'm just waiting for that check to show up in the mailbox. I'm waiting to, to tell somebody, well, you know, I have a financial need, and for them to open up their wallet and say, here you go. That's not the way God works. God promised the Israelites, I've got a promised land for you. Now what do you need to go do? Go take it. But God, there's folks already there. They already live there. Right. Kick them out. Get up. Get going. Get moving. Go take what he's promised for you. People don't want that. They want the blessing of God to fall without the work. But this is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 9. And I'm going to read starting in verse 23 through 26. Then he said to them all, Jesus is talking. This is Jesus. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross, what? Daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Other translations will say lose their soul, right? Because the soul is the seed of who we are. Verse 26, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them. And when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father... End of the holy angels. Now you want to talk about a difficult passage of scripture to swallow. Verse 26, Luke 9, 26. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and the glory of his Father and holy angels. Now you pull any Christian anywhere and say, are you ashamed of Jesus? Well, no, of course I'm not. I'm not ashamed. Okay. <clears throat> How do you know? I, I, I believe in God. I believe that Jesus did this. I be, here's the thing with, with shame. You can't be ashamed of something you don't believe in. Okay? you got to believe in it first before you ever need to be ashamed of it. If you've ever been ashamed of maybe a relationship that you're in, you have to believe in that relationship and its impact on your life to be ashamed of it. If you want, if you've ever been ashamed of the choices that you've made or the things that you've done, you have to acknowledge and believe, yeah, I I believe in those things. That's why I'm ashamed of them. In the book of James, it says, you say that you believe in God. Good, even the demons believe and shudder, right? Anybody familiar with that passage of scripture? It's not about what you believe in, but but the word shame finds something totally different. If I am ashamed of someone, I'm not spending time with them. 
I'm not walking with them, being with them. I mean, can I dated this girl once. Yes, there was someone before Sarah. I'm sorry. Cover your ears. No. Uh, <laughs> Look, I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? Can I do that for a minute? I don't like church and stuff up very much. It was the kind of relationship that wasn't built on anything healthy, okay? Here's how you know. We only hung out late at night, and the hanging out, we didn't do much hanging out. Y'all tracking with me so far? And, and she asked me once, why don't we ever go anywhere? Uh, well, you know, I work a lot. I'm really busy during the day. I just, I don't really have time for that. I've only got time to hit you up at 11, 12 o'clock at night to see what you're doing for the next couple of hours. I didn't want to be seen with her in public. I didn't want to go anywhere that someone might recognize me and go, is that that's your girl? How many of you are thinking this is a pretty disgusting picture so far? Be honest. It's pretty, pretty gross, right? Yeah, that's how I treated her. That was my idea of, can I just call it a late night booty call? Can, can we call it that? Because that's all it really was. Is that something to be proud of? No, that's not how we're even supposed to treat women let alone operate in our own lives, right? How ashamed do you think that this woman felt that I called myself her boyfriend, that she called herself my girlfriend? Does that sound right to you? Would anybody think that that's a right way to go about things? Now, you're looking at me sideways right now. I see it, okay? Pastor, I don't know how. What are you talking about? Let me just tell you, we treat Jesus the same way every time we have an opportunity to live like we've say, we, we, we believe, like what we say we believe and we don't. Nobody likes to be relegated to the side. Amen? Oh, it's getting pretty quiet. I'm sorry. Did I offend some folks? Let me try this again. Nobody likes to be relegated to the side. And the Lord of all creation who saved our very souls through his spent and purchased blood does not need to be treated like some side piece. He says, if you want to be with me, you put that ring on your finger and you own it and you wear it and you make sure everybody can see it. If I say that I love my wife, but I won't take her anywhere, I won't go out with her, I won't spend any time with her, how much do I really love her? You know, I say, well, no, babe, I'm not ashamed. Could you do me a favor and just, like, cover up your face when we go out so no one can really see you? Let's do silly things like pray really quietly in the restaurant just because i got to pray for my food. Because if you don't pray for it, you choke on it, right? Okay, real quick, let me just... Da, da, da. Or in the workplace, you get caught up in conversations that you know you ought not be having, but nobody wants to be that religious weirdo, right? Nobody wants to be ostracized. Nobody wants to be thought less of because, well, you know, uh, he's one of those weirdo Jesus freaks. He says, if you're ashamed of me, and ashamed doesn't mean that you would ever say, oh, I'm ashamed of you. If you don't live right, if you don't act right, if you don't walk right, if you don't talk right, if you don't do the things that you're supposed to do, he will not acknowledge you before the Father in heaven. Is that what you want? It's not what I want. Do you know how hard it is to stand up and talk about some of the things that I talk about? But here's the thing, I would never ever want to paint a picture of you that would make you think more highly of me than I deserve. Can I tell you at my core, apart from Jesus, I'm a scumbag. I'm not, Sarah has, (laughs) we've had lots of conversations about growing up and she's told me, you were not a nice person. You were not a good person. See, Sarah was a good person. We all have our issues, but Sarah grew in a nice family and a ni- nice people, nice friendships. And yeah, she had stuff she dealt with too, but Sarah was just nice. I was not. I got in a lot of trouble. I caused a lot of trouble. I caused a lot of pain, heartache, and grief. And you know what? I'm not proud of it. As a matter of fact, the older I get, I think the more ashamed I feel of it. Anybody know what I mean? You get a little bit older and put a little more distance between who you were and who you're trying desperately to be now. And you realize that that road is paved with, oh my gosh, what did I do? He 
can't believe I told that story in church. But it's true. It's true. And you know what? I don't want to treat Jesus like that. And you can say that's a pretty harsh parallel. That's a pretty strict comparison. It's the analogy that Jesus draws in, in Scripture. The bride of Christ being consecrated and holy and set apart for him. Um, not like in the book of Hosea where my namesake comes from. You Remember who Hosea married? A prostitute. Okay, The man of God was called to, to marry a woman who has sex for money. You could pick one analogy or the other that you want to align your Christian walk with. For me, I, I want to be part of the bride. I want that relationship. I don't want to relegate Jesus to the side. Anybody with me? Here's what we get to do now. Our final act of worship this morning, we're actually going to prepare to take communion. So I'm going to ask the Casey and the worship team to come up. Here's what I absolutely love about communion, okay? It is a chance to do business with God. You know, growing up, <laughs> the only time we ever spent time at the dinner table together was a couple of holidays a year. You guys know what I'm talking about? Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, maybe, or to get in trouble. I would get lectured at the kitchen table a lot, right? I would get lectured at the kitchen table. That's where my parents would, would sit down with me and say, you know, I just don't like this, don't get whatever. So, but the cool thing about coming to the table of God is that we get to do business with him and it's not always negative, right? See, when I married Sarah, she, she insisted that we have dinner at the table together every night as a family. I'm like, what? There's two of us. What are you talking about? This is weird. We sit on the couch in front of the TV. She insisted that we eat dinner at the table. Anybody do that as a family? Yeah, such a different experience. I don't like not doing it now, okay? When she was gone, when they were still in California and I was by myself, I would still sit at the table all alone. Jerob, how was your day? Oh, my day was great. Thanks for asking, Jerob. There's just something to be said for the family spending time at the table, right? This uh, Communion really is an opportunity for us to do business with God, to be at the table together with him. Now, our hearts have to be in a certain place. We have to be willing to receive from him, right? It's not a chance for you to come and dump your conscience and, okay, see, I did my part and I feel better. It's an opportunity to come and make your heart right before him. So here's what we're going to do. Up the middle, right? You know what we said? Come on up. You're going to grab the elements over here. Mike's going to serve you, okay? You can come on up, Mike. Mike's going to serve you the communion elements. I want you to take them, and I want you to go back to your seat because we're going to all do them together. Can we do that? I love communion. I really do. Especially when it's good bread. I'm just saying. But we all do it together as a family. Everything we do, we do together. Amen? We're a church family, and we do this together. We rise together, we fall together, we succeed together, we struggle together. Everything that we do that will ever work, that will ever happen, that will ever go right, we will do it together or we won't do it at all. Amen? There will be no fracture. There will be no separation. There will be no factions or people to this side or that side. We do it together as a family. So here's what I'm going to, as the worship team leads, just come on up the front here. Come get the elements. Just return to your seat, whether on the sides, if that's easier for you, or back down the middle. And, and towards the end of the song, I'll get up and I'll lead us together. Amen? Jesus, meet us here now. So come to your table. We bless you, Jesus.